The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 39 Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider becoming a patron of The Bearded Wit by going to patreon.com forward slash The Bearded Wit. You can support me from as little as $5 a month, which is essentially a cup of coffee, uh, and that will mean that I will be able to continue producing this material and other podcasts that I do, and it would mean the world to me to have you um, know that you're, you've got my back on this. Uh, I love producing this material for people, and it's been a huge pleasure for me to do this, uh, which basically started as a project for family and friends right back at the beginning beginning of March last year uh, when the um, uh, COVID-19 virus was really beginning to kick in. It was a way of basically connecting friends and family all over the world who were finding it a bit difficult as we all did and it's grown into something where I've got a lot of people listening all over the world. It would mean the world to me if you could take the time just to pop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit, sign up from as little as five dollars a month, as I say, uh, it's a cup of coffee. It would mean the world to me because the more of you guys, you fabulous people out there that do it, the more I'm able to do more of this stuff for you on an ongoing basis. No obligation, but if you can, I would be so deeply grateful. Also, if you could take a moment to pop over to Facebook and uh, give The Bearded Wit a like and follow, uh, and also go over to my new YouTube channel as well, um, just search for The Bearded Wit, uh, and subscribe. Uh, I'll be putting all of the live readings slightly edited um, and cleaned up a bit uh, onto that uh, over the coming weeks. Um, But yeah, join up, uh, get involved, like, share, follow, subscribe, do all the usual social media things. Okay, on with the reading. Thanks very much, everyone. First things first, slurp of tea. Mm-hmm. And I say it every time, I do love tea. I am so very, very English. Um, so, quick recap. Where are we? We have got to uh, the sixth book in the series. We are in uh, And Another Thing, which is the book that was penned by Owen Colfer. Uh, he is the chap that was basically given permission and the support of anyone and everything to do with Douglas's work to write the sixth book um, uh, in the series. The book that, that uh, uh, Douglas Adams himself admitted he, he would, would was he was notoriously bad at writing in terms of deadlines. And it was kind of the book that he would have wished to, to write because he himself acknowledged that the the end of the fifth book was quite bleak uh, and he wanted to have a, a, a slightly less cynical ending for, for the various elements of, of the the crew uh, of, of the Heart of Gold and, and all things pertaining. So anyway, <clears throat> we're into that book. Um, instead of them being obliterated by the death rays from the Grebulons, they have been saved by uh, Wow Bagger, the infinitely prolonged, on the promise uh, that Zaphod, who has separated his two heads, or certainly separated the two brains, uh, or two parts of his brains, or the two brains from his each head, uh, and one of them was being used to power the Heart of Gold's navigational systems, uh, and that got so caught up in its own ego that they were almost about to be sliced to pieces in reality. Uh, and uh, instead, at that point, Wow Bagger the Infinitely Prolonged turned up to insult somebody I think, if I, if I remember right, he was going to insult Arthur Dent again, but or something, or Zaphod possibly. Um, but instead, Zaphod made the promise that actually um, he could actually get Wow Bagger killed, uh, which, given that Wow Bagger has, is almost in actually in in with the amount of t- traveling backwards and forwards through space and time, he is now older than the universe itself. He's quite happy at the idea of actually being offed. Uh, so he is going to, he, he's holding um, uh, Zaphod to that uh, that promise. Um, you are seeing the picture. Sorry, I can't see it on 
Can you? Can you? Can you? Can you? I hope. Sorry. Um, very odd. I, th I thought that I, all I've got on the Facebook feed is just the holding page. But if you're actually seeing me talking, uh, again, if someone could give me a quick note to that in the comments, I'd appreciate that. Um, my uh, systems have been playing silly buggers uh, all day. But there you go. Okay, sorry, sorry. So Zephod is is definitely um, looking to get himself um, uh, some some score some brownie points with Wow Bagger. He's on his way off to. Um, uh, to Asgard, and what we found out actually is that the gods aren't that happy with him, and that uh, he's likely to get something of a warm. Thank you, Christopher. Um, uh, Zephod is going to get something of a, a, a warm reception should he go to Asgard. Um, and, and also, we have found out that um, Prostetnik Vogon Jeltz has been informed by his son, um, who is an, uh, in the greatest compliment possible to a Vogon, an utter bastard. Um, he has informed his father that uh, there is a colony of humanoids that have escaped Earth. And of course, being a Vogon, he will not rest until the strict word of his orders have been fulfilled. And that is that every last human being is dead. So he's now off to try and, I think, what he would probably qualify as finish up his paperwork. So that's where we are. Um, it's been a long time waiting. You've been incredibly patient. Thank you so much for waiting. Let's crack on, eh? All right. Last little sip of tea, and then we'll get into it. So we're on the heart of gold, back all back on the heart of gold. The heart of gold. The heart of gold flew through the multicoloured and very textured space of everywhere. With the infinite improbability drive engaged, the ship became part of the universe itself until the coordinates slotted into their tumblers and popped the craft out at the correct destination with the interstellar travel equivalent of ta-da, scaring the hell out of the person parked in the next bay. But until that moment, anything could happen especially anything that was highly improbable, which of course then made it probable, which rendered it improbable again, repeating ad infinitum. Most people preferred to shut their eyes during improbability flights to shield their psyches from the improbabilities occurring around them, but Zephod often taped his eyes open so that he wouldn't miss a thing. During the trip to Asgard, Dinah Carlinton Houseney, one of Zaphod's favourite singer-slash-prostitutes, broke through from the afterlife to sing possibly prophetic lyrics in hysterical falsetto. I won't do the falsetto. Um, oh, Zaphod, baby, the fist is gonna fall. Hey, thought Zaphod, my name in a song, Fruity. Zephod, my baby, sang Diona. You gotta climb that wall. Zephod tried to clap along, but his hands were miles away, arms stretching into space. You'll look good, Diona. Great, in fact. No de decomposition or anything. I always hoped the afterlife would be like that. Diona placed three hands on her hips, using a fourth to hold the microphone stalk. You are not listening to me, Mr. President. I, I, I don't want to listen. I, I want to ask you stuff. Do you get many sub -ether channels where you are? I love celeb stalk. Do you get that? Diona waved away this talk of entertainment, continuing with her song. Zephod baby, you got to walk across that bridge. How about alcohol? You tell him what his secret name is, Zaph Baby, and he's going to let you in. Yeah, okay, Bridges, whatever, but, but seriously, have you had something done? Because I think you look even better now. Diona's eyes flashed. Your grandfather told me not to come. That boy is an idiot, he said. He won't listen, he never does. It was cryptic, protested Zaphod. Cryptic is hard. Cryptic? It was a goddamn nursery rhyme. 
Anyone could figure it out. Zaphod frowned. Something about a wall and a bridge. And the secret name. Come on, Mr. President, this is important. Wasn't there a fist in there somewhere? I like things with fists, especially when the thumb is sticking up. I saw a cartoon once where the stupid guy sticks his thumb into his own eye and, oh, for Zark's sake, said Diona, and turned into an ice sculpture of herself, which then proceeded to melt, dripping upwards into the ceiling. As each drop touched the panels, it exploded with a tinkling, oh. That girl always could sing, murmured Zaphod, and then settled back and waited for probability to reassert itself. He could see two incredible new colours that his brain could only describe as dangerous and shifty, and jagged indents were being hammered into the spaceship walls as though the heart of gold was being rammed by a colossal, spiked creature. Whoa! yelped Zaphod, as a spike shot up between his legs. How soon for normality, left brain? Left brain popped up from an electro electrolytic gel flask on the main console. Who knows, in an environment like this, he said, gel dropping in blobs from this frictionless orb. In actual time, five seconds, but not necessarily in the order or regularity that we are accustomed to. Normality returned with a whinny of tiny ponies and a procession of animated chanting skeletons across the bridge. I can see right through you, they chanted. Can you see right through me? The ponies and skeletons were gone and the bridge was as normal as it was ever likely to get, considering the ship's navigator was the captain's disembodied head. Zaphod blinked. Are, uh, are we normal, LB? Left brain zoomed around the main cabin, touching base with the various infrared sensors set into the instruments. Affirmative, Zephyr, the improbability drive has spiralled down, and we are in real space. Excellent. Sorry, excellent, said Zephyr, unstrapping himself from his flight seat. I have trouble telling the difference sometimes between what and, and what not. He leapt to his feet, gangling across to wrap to the wraparound view screen, his silver boot heels tinging on the ceramic floor. Okay, so uh, what do we got here? A planet covered with ice? That's exactly what I did not expect to see, or rather I expected to see it from the inside. Why are we outside the barrier, LB? Oh, why? Oh, why? Left brain screwed one eye shut. The face he made when analysing streamed data. The Aesir have installed a new shield since our last visit. Zaphod pounded the air like a frustrated philosopher trying to force existentialist concepts onto a pragmatist mind. Those crafty immortals with their little beards and horny helmets! I thought shields didn't work on improbability drives! Left brain hung um, momentarily wordless, running millions of calculations a second, refining his syntax, paring away any superfluous language until he arrived at... You thought? Don't make me laugh. Zaphod executed a misconceived dubat a spinning kick, which missed the hovering orb by several feet and made his groin tendon sing like a violin. Guide note. President Beeblebrox's brains, uh, sorry, President Beeblebrox's kick was misconceived because the ancient art of Dubart R had been developed by the Shaltanax of Brup Kidron 13, who were a happy and power peaceful race. The spinning kick was employed to jog jupelberries from their shrubs with minimal disturbance to the plant itself. Any attempt to use Dubat R for aggressive reasons would activate the subliminal condition in the training chance and turn the attacker's body upon itself. Zaphod did not know this, as he learned the technique from a hologram on the back of a Zuga Nuggets box. 
Really, Zaphod, said Left Brain, hovering at a safe altitude, we have a task to complete. There is not time for your usual petty antics. There is always time for antics, moaned Zaphod from his fetal position around a chair stem. Antics get me out of bed in the morning. Left Brain knew this to be true, but he had never quite understood why. Is that why we're here, Zaphod? So that you have something to do? Zaphod twanged his tendon gently. I am Zaphod Breevelbrax, L.B., and with the life I've had, it's only a matter of time before I run into a humongous anticlimax. I aim to put that off as long as possible. Left Brain unscrewed his eye. I don't think that's going to be a problem, not with the amount of firepower pointed at us. Excellent, proclaimed Zaphod. "'Strained tendon forgotten. "'It seems like ages since we've been up against impossible odds "'with no reasonable chance of survival.' "'Not long enough,' said Left Brain, "'and transferred the incoming call onto the main screen. "'No,' said Heimdall, god of light, emphatically. "'But I haven't. No!' repeated Heimdall, his huge, bald head filling the screen, his eyes boiling like red gas giants. Zaphod tried again. You don't even know what... No, no, no. I don't care what it is, Beeblebrox. No is the answer. Now, improbable yourself off somewhere else before I set the dragons on you. Just hear me out, pleaded Zaphod. Nope. Five seconds, what could it hurt? No, any question you could ask me, the answer would be no. Zaphod spat it out quickly. Is Thor home? No, he bloody isn't, roared Heimdall, the tips of his waxed moustache quivering. Really? The Asgardian god bared his teeth. Actually, yes. Yes, he is home. You're in bloody Asgard, aren't you? He is. Could I? No! It's back to negatives again, my friend. And when I say my friend, I actually mean my hated enemy who I would like to see disemboweled and then sprinkled with salt. Oh, Come on, Heimdall, forget all those misunderstandings and negotiate a little. This is important. Heimdall's cheeks were so red that it seemed quite possible that his head would explode. Misunderstandings. Miss under Z Zark, me! You have a lot of nerve, crap, parprod. You have enough sheer bloody gall for an entire bucket of gallstones. Guide note. Gallstones, light grey pebbles found on Damagran. Very cheeky. What say we put the past behind us, where it belongs, and just start again? We can do that, can't we? We're both rational adults. We're both rational adults. We are, but you should see Thor now. He's just a bag of nerves with a helmet on top after what you did to him. That's why I want to talk to the boy, to explain. Heimdall took a moment for some breathing exercises, blowing into the gloved fingers of one hand which he wiggled before his face. Explain, he said finally. You want to explain? Yeah. That's all I want from you wonderful guards, said Zaphod in tones that would have the sucky crawlers of Sikio Fantasia reaching for their vomit bags. A chance to explain and possibly make amends for my previous mistakes. Amends, eh? Heimdall said. I suppose you do need to make amends. Yes, yes, of course I do. I repent... And I deserve penance. I know what you're doing there, said Heimdall, scowling. You're pushing my god buttons. 
Who do you think you're fooling? I'm serious. Look at this face. Heimdall leaned in until his eyes filled the screen. These were eyes that could slice through the fat of a normal person's lies and find the bone of truth deep within. Very well, Zaphod Beeble bastard. Come outside and let's talk about amends. Uh, come outside? Into space? Won't that be cold? Fear not, mortal. I will extend a bubble of atmosphere to you. Just uh, step outside, then. Out you come, Zaphod. Alone. You have one minute to decide. Left brain hovered at Zaphod's shoulder. I think you should probably go, he said. Don't worry about me. I'll be fine here inside the ship. I'm sure the atmosphere bubble will hold its integrity. Can you check it? Left brain squinted for a moment and then spasmed as lightning flashed inside his dome. Ugh. Ugh. The Asgardian computer doesn't share information, apparently. Little spider bots clicked along the glass, nipping at the scorch marks. Uh, there isn't a line out from the entire planet. Um, if you go out there, you are on your own. Zaphod sighed and straightened his coat. People like me, LB, the truly great ones, we are always alone. LB nodded. That was good, uh, but I wasn't ready with the lighting. Uh, give me a second and then try it again. Uh, okay, something warm. Not oh, directly overhead. Makes my hair look thin. Left brain interfaced with the ship's illuminations, putting a yellow spotlight onto Zaphod's face. Ready? What would you say my motivation was? Greatness. Pure, undiluted greatness. Zaphon, Zaphod nodded gravely, accepting the truth of this. He steepled his fingers and spoke slowly. People like me, he began. Then left brain opened a tube and shot him into space. Guide note. As divine dynasties go, the Aesir, the gods of Asgard, are not exactly the biggest pseudopods on the amoeboid. Adored on less than a thousand worlds, they can fairly be classed as middle-tier gods. Zeus, the father of the rival Olympians, has often publicly claimed that he has pulled fluff balls from his navel that were bigger than Asgard. But this is more likely simply an attempt to exacerbate Odin's legendary planet envy. Odin and Zeus have had a bit of a thing going for several thousand years, ever since Zeus accidentally turned Odin into a wild boar during one of his take-human-form-and-plant-some-wild-oats visits to the planet Earth. But even though the gods of Asgard have not achieved the same level of penetration as the Olympians, or even some of the novelty gods such as Pasta Fasta, who began his career as a restaurant chain icon, uh, they are significant for what they have contributed to popular culture, most notably the horn, which they use to decorate their ceremonial helmets, create music, and, most importantly, fill with beer. Scientists have postulated that without the phrase, do you fancy a horn of beer, in their lexicon, several worlds would never have emerged from their cataclysmic planetary war phase. Heimdall, god of light, left Zaphod thrashing in the inky void for 29 seconds before lobbing out an atmosphere yolo yo-yo to reel him to safety. In those 29 seconds, Zaphod Beeblebrox was forced to think on the inside of his head rather than transmitting his thoughts directly to the universe as he preferred. His tangent-ridden reflection resulted in the oft-quoted Beeble Brox's Inner Monologue, of which there are two published versions. The official one, which Zaphod produced after a weekend on the writer Ulon Kalufid's estate, 
and the unofficial version, which was picked up telepathically by Left Brain and included in his memoirs, Life in a Fishbowl. Both accounts will be presented, and you can make up your own mind as to which is the more accurate. The official version. And so, the moment has arrived. I grieve bitterly not for myself, but for those who have been denied the ecstasy of knowing Zephard Beeblebrox. People will recognize the name, I suppose. Beeblebrox has done a few small things in his short existence. How will I be remembered? As a supernova, perhaps, a celestial body that blazes in the night sky, a light in the darkness, granting those that felt its heat on their faces a moment of wonder and perhaps hope. This would be enough. There are those who heap praise upon my shoulders, lauding me as a prophet, a revolutionary, or a great satisfier of women. I accept the praise with gracious modesty. But if I could choose my own epitaph, I would simply say that Zephod Beeblebrox surprised everyone in a good way. The unofficial version. Oh, Zark! Big! 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 Space! Everywhere! But no air! My, my, my hair will collapse! And I always bloat in zero-G! Heimdall, you total bastard! Look, a ball of ice, smoothy, shiny! I, I, I wish I could lick it! What underpants am I wearing? Oh, for the autopsy, you need to think about these things! New ones with, with drainage, I hope. Oh, Ford, dude, you were fruity. We were fruity together, but I was slightly more fruity. I bet this gets big coverage. It's not every day a galactic president gets dumped out of an airlock by his own head. There was a third version that flickered just below the surface of Zaphod's consciousness. Left brain didn't hear it, and Zaphod didn't remember it. So, Zaphod's buried personality monologued internally, as I did not hold my breath, there will be no lung damage. But that does mean I have less than half a minute before oxygen-deprived blood reaches my brain. I could have done so much more with my time. Celebrity. <clears throat> Asgard. How are we doing for time? Hold on. Oop. Yeah, we're good. Asgard. The light god watched Zaphod's spasm with no little satisfaction in his all seeing eyes. He stood on the lip of Bifrost, the portal between Asgard and the rest of the universe counting down the seconds until he would have to choose between rescuing Thor's old manager or letting him die. It hardly seemed like a choice at all, since Heimdall hated mortals in general, except the noble Sigurd of legend, and Beeblebrox in particular. But letting men die in the vicinity of Asgard was definitely frowned on by Odin, as martyrs had a tendency to live forever which was ironic, as they were dead. Or maybe it was paradoxical, not ironic. One of those tricky terms that Loki banded around to, to fluster him. Heimdall was a soldier, and didn't crowd his brain with extraneous vocabulary. Hunt, kill, burn, flay. Those were the kind of words he liked especially flay, but it was difficult to work into everyday conversation. Heimdall pouted for a moment, then sent a gloopy plasma string undulating from the tip of the Gjallad horn, of the Gjala horn, the legendary harbinger of Ragnarok. 
Yalahorn might seem to the casual observer like your typical 20-foot Old Norse yelling horn, but in the hands of a god it became a tool of great power and a handy vessel for beer drinking games. At the tip of the plasma string there was a bubble of atmosphere which Heimdall fly fished in space until he managed to snare Zaphod. The plasma shell would give the Betelgeusian quite a shock when he jittered through to the breathable air inside, but Heimdall was not the least worried about that. The god's only concern about Zaphod Beeblebrox's pain was to ensure that there was plenty of it in his immediate future. His immediate past, too, if he could get a time pass from Odin. He reeled Zaphod in and landed him on the Rainbow Bridge. Guide Note The term Rainbow Bridge is an example of how gods in general are given to rhetoric and aggrandizement. Osiris did not just have a flu which knocked him sideways for a few weeks, he died and rose again. Aphrodite did not just have a wardrobe full of low-cut blouses and an inexhaustible supply of dirty limericks, she was irresistible to all males everywhere. And the Rainbow Bridge was not just spectacularly engineered suspension bridge of ice and steel, it was, according to the Aesir, an actual bridge of rainbows. Zaphod jittered for a minute while the plasma evaporated, then moaned as he realised that his silver boot heels had melted while passing through the charged shell. Hold on a second, I don't know if an alarm is going off. Stay where you are folks, I'll be back in a second. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm in my office <laughs> and I think they've just put the alarm on <laughs> and I might have triggered it a bit. So sorry about that. I'm back now. Right, <laughs> where did we get to? Well, I've slept tea. Right. <laughs> Oh yes, we've just had the description of the fact that the gods are a bit prone to hyperbole uh, and they are insistent that the uh, Bifrost is actually a bridge of rainbows. So on we go. Zaphod jittered for a minute while the plasma evaporated and then moaned as he realised that his silver boot heels had melted while passing through the charged shell. Oh, come on, he moaned. Do you realise how many silver-tongued devil's tongues went into those heels? This is the worst day of my life. Heimdall loomed over him, his grin several yards wide. I am delighted to hear it. That... Rainbow Bridge is made of ice and steel, said Zaphod in petulant revenge for the boot heels. Silence, roared Heimdall, or you shall be flayed. I'm already afraid. No, not afraid. Afraid, oh, um, not afraid. Make up your mind. I said flayed F flayed the skin flayed from your body peeled from it zaphod gulped comically now i am afraid is that allowed heimdall pinched his nose and quietly quietly recited the first verse of the volsunga saga which generally calmed him down but this time even sigurd's exploits could not soothe his pounding heart while Heimdall was reciting, Zaphod processed the loss of his heels and decided that he had bigger palms to wrangle. He jumped to his feet, immediately fell over, tried to cover the embarrassing fall with a backwards tumble, stood upright once more, tottered around for a second until he found a gate that worked with no high heeled with no heeled high heels, and then treated himself to a three sixty spin. Wow! 
he concluded. I have to say, Heimdall, this is one hoopy world you guys have here. Uh, I mean, wow. Is that a waterfall? How big is that? Heimdall tried one last verse before replying. It's the fountain of youth, if you must know. Frigga fancied a water feature. That's great. Landscape gardening in the future. No, it isn't, said Heimdall gloomily. Ragnarok, Ragnarok is the future. The gods will perish, and the universe will drown in blood. Zaphod nodded. Now that, that would be a fountain worth seeing. But for now, let's stay positive, eh, big feller? We're not drowning in blood yet. Heimdall was indeed a big fellow, especially when seen directly from below. Gazing up at a god's crotch can do wonders for a person's lack of low self-esteem, especially when the crotch contours are tightly bound by the leggings of a red and neon blue striped ski jumpsuit. Heimdall spent his life has uh, spent his days and nights on the ice, and so leggings. So, Heimdall spent his days and nights on the ice, and so apparently had decided to dress the part. He had eschewed the traditional mammaloid leggings in favour of snowboarding boots, and there was a pair of orange tinted ski goggles perched on his forehead and a stripe of sunblock on his nose. So, uh, hate to hurry things along, but you know my old buddy, Thor, any chance you could see your way clear to letting me in and seeing him? Heimdall's vision of the apocalypse faded, and he peered down at Zaphod. Amends, you said. You wanted to make amends. Zaphod pasted on his most disarming smile. Well, I would say that, wouldn't I? In my defence, I didn't mean a word of it. I was under duress. You know the drill, Zaphod. Not tasks. Come on, Heimdall, that's so oldy-worldy. I thought you guys were getting with the times. Asgard does not change. What about that water feature? That wasn't there on my last visit. Significantly. Asgard does not change significantly. Three tasks, Beeblebrox, if you really want to talk. Three? I don't have time for three. Your tasks take forever. I'll do one. Three, insisted Heimdall, eyes bulging in their sockets. One, repeated Zaphod. I'm just going to kill you. Screw it. Zaphod rocked back on his biological heels and then rocked forward a step. You're bluffing, big boy. I know the rules here. No one gets struck off the coil on Asgard, on Asgard without the big O say so. Don't push me, because I will call him. Yeah? What's stopping you? Maybe Odin, Odin doesn't give out his number to gatekeepers. Heimdall shook his massive head. Don't do it, Beeble bollocks. Don't make me call the guy. He's no fan of yours. Call him. Go ahead. You won't, though, because he's number one and you're... Well, you don't even have a number. Odin, Odin could be enjoying a nice horn of honeymead, and your call might make him drop it. Then, <gasps> holy Zark, it's Ragnarok. Heimdall pointed a finger the size of a torpedo. Right. That's it. I am calling. Are you? Looks like you're talking to me. Lots of flapping lips. Not much number punching. Be this on your own head, Zaphod, muttered the god. All I wanted was three tasks, four tops. He waggled his horn in a certain way, and it collapsed into itself until it fit neatly into the god's palm. This is it. No turning back. Of course there is. You're full of buffer biscuit. Buffer! 
croaked Heimdall in the choked tones of a Falfang and phlegm ferret, having its throat tickled for the precious pharmacopoeia in its mucus. Buffer, you say? He punched in an umber on the horn's keypad and hummed his way through a few seconds of ringing. Yep, hello. Uh, Odie, it's me, he said into the horn. Heimdall closed one eye and endured, endured a few seconds of abuse from the father of the gods. Oh, OK. Sorry, I do realise that you have a lot of golden plankton balls to churn out, and I know mead stains. Freeze your shirt, and then the mark comes right out. Listen, I've got someone here, a mortal. I, I just want the go-ahead to kill him. More abuse. Zaphod could easily catch the tone from ten feet below phone level. I, I know we don't. I'm aware of policy. Uh, of course, I, I read the document, the bullet points anyway. Zaphod drifted away from the conversation, already impatient with a situation that did not feature him. As a child, Zaphod had been diagnosed with ADHDDAAADHDABT, which stood for Always Dreaming His Dopey Days Away, also attention deficit hyperflatulence disorder, not to mention a bit thick. Even as an adult, Zaphod could not manage this condition because he could never remember what he suffered from. A couple of Ds, he told his pill guy on Eroticon 4, maybe an H. He was prescribed an appointment for DDH, which was double-dose hemorrhoids. Zaphod stopped using the appointment after a couple of days, because he couldn't keep it down. <laughs> Sorry, such an idiot. So, even though Heimdall and Odin were discussing his immediate future and the amount of discomfort contained therein, Zaphod found himself distracted by the twinkly lights of Asgard. It was an amazing sight, even for one accustomed to the shiny shiny of wide, wonderful space. Size-wise, Asgard was no Megabrantis Delta, but what was there made a big impression. For a start, there was the whole encased in ice thing, which cast a flickering silver-blue light show over the entire surface. The surface itself was littered with the kind of dramatic topographic features that would drive a Magrathian to industrial espionage. Mighty, gushing rivers, high, snow-peaked mountains, and fjords as intricate as a Twitter flitter's electrocardiogram readout. Glistening ice fields coexisted impossibly alongside tracts of golden corn, all bathed by sun rays that could not be traced back to any star. Towering castles breached the clouds. Dragons coiled around their turrets. It was a dream world. If the dreamers were testosterone fueled males who were never forced to behave like adults. Heimdall was saying something. Hmm? said Zaphod. I got the green light, said the god, smiling happily. Well, what green light? said, uh, what do you need a green light for? It's a saying. The green light means go. Go, go, go where? Nowhere. I'm not going anywhere. Then why do you need a green light? Heimdall pinched his nose. Forth Sigurd feeders till he comes to the dwelling of a mighty chief called Hymir. He had to wife a sister of Brunhild, who was known as Beckhild, as she had bided at home and learned woman's work, whereas Brunhild followed unto the wars, so was she called Brunhild. I see, said Zaphod, wondering if he might use the craziness as a cover to nip across the bridge as if reading his mind, which he probably could, Heimdall blocked Zaphod's path with a massive fur-trimmed boot. I told Odin it was you. 
Zaphod was suddenly a little more nervous than he had been. And what did he say? He said that you were a well-known public figure. So, to make your death confusing. Confusing? Heimdall bent double, shaking Gjallarhorn to its original length. You're shaking your horn to its original length, noted Zaphod. I'm going to summon the dragons. So that they can kill me in a confusing way? Zaphod surmised. Heimdall's grin seemed wide as a crescent moon. That's right, Beetlepox. I'm going to instruct them to kill you by accident, but make it look like a murder. Oh, said Zaphod. What about the tasks? There must be a golden axe somewhere you guys need me to find. You wanted one task, said Heimdall. That's exactly what you're getting. Zaphod blew into his hands. Good. Great. Can we get on with it then? I am freezing. My spare neck hole feels, well, it really feels the cold, which incidentally is the title of my next album. It's a simple task said Heimdall innocently. All you need to do is cross the bridge. Cross the bridge, Seyford thought. That sounds familiar. And again, bridge is a common enough word and often used in a metaphorical sense. Which bridge? The bridge! roared Heimdall, his beard quivering. The bloody bridge, this one that you're standing on. Oh, okay, just trying to get the details straight. Cross this bridge I'm standing on. Okay, anything else? There's a tube of false atmosphere, so you won't drift off. If you make the first wall, you need to climb it. I gotta climb on that wall. Familiar. But the word wall is even more common than bridge. So, cross and climb. Got it. And no hidden tricks. Apart from the dragons trying to tumble you into the abyss? No. Zaphod frowned. So, the dragons are not friendly dragons, singing songs and stuff, like in the kiddie stories. They do sing. Death dirges. Really? What rhymes with flay? A rare flash of perceptive wit from Zaphod at the worst possible moment. Oh, very good. You just cut ten seconds off your head start. Heimdall adopted a heroic stance, which is not easy when one is clad in a garish ski suit, but in fairness the god carried it off. He raised his horn and blew a long, undulating series of notes that sounded suspiciously like the old Beetlejuicean nursery rhyme, Arkel Schmarkel sat on a schmed, but with a semitone more implied violence. Zaphod felt a sudden chill in the scar tissue where his second neck used to be. He turned on the spot where one of his silver heels, until recently, had twinkled, and ran like blazes through the tube of false atmosphere across the so-called Rainbow Bridge. And that is where we will leave it for this evening. Thank you all so much for joining me. Um, again, once again, please do uh, support what I'm doing. Um, it's been scrolling on the bottom of the screen. Oh, no, it's not in the picture. There we go. All the way across here. Support this channel. Become a patron on patreon.com forward slash thebeardedwit. Um, 
I will be back again in two weeks. It's going to be every fortnight we're doing this at the moment. Um, so in two weeks' time, I will see you again. I will put up another uh, um, message on, on Facebook and create an event for it. Uh, do like and follow uh, on, on Facebook. Um, uh, follow The Bearded Wit. You'll also find me on... Oh, uh, LinkedIn, um, uh, yeah, actually you will, um, but also on, um, sorry, Instagram and YouTube channel. I am now also putting all of these readings up on YouTube as well. I think we're up to uh, episode 11, I think went out possibly earlier this evening, actually. Um, so do do um, follow along um, on, on there as well. Um, please do support what I'm doing. It means a hell of a lot. Uh, thank you again for being patient. I will see you all in a couple of weeks time thank you very much look after yourselves be good to each other be hoopy and be fruity goodbye guys thanks a lot 